Okay, just a short warning before we get started. I am, <laughs> what's the expression, running on fumes right now? Uh, I was in the studio last week and then I went, I came home Wednesday and then flew out to Florida Thursday morning. And I think I've taught around 15 hours in the, in three days. So, <laughs> uh, my voice didn't give out, so that's Baruch Hashem, but my brain at this point has given out. I've been up since 3.15 this morning uh, to get to the airport on time and, and all that good stuff. And uh, So if I say something really crazy, just <laughs> you, can, you can tell me later how crazy it sounded. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be in a lot better frame of mind and, and body next week. But tonight I wanted to focus on a passage that I think a lot of us have, in a, in a casual reading of it, it sounds barbaric. And you already know which, which passage I'm talking about. It's the, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth passage. So let's back up a little bit to, let's see. I'm the one that needs to back up. I've been reading ahead, um, which, by the way, this this is my Torah portion, um, based on my birthday. My Torah portion is Mishpatim. So, I was looking through it uh, on the flight back today, and I'm thinking, good grief! Of all the Torah portions, I get the one that's really full of the the punishment and death and judgment and <laughs> all that good stuff. So, Baruch Hashem, right? Um, but let's go to chapter 21. And I want to, I want what I mean by back up, I want to back up from the eye for an eye passage and see if we can get full context. And I'll give you an example, especially for the new people. Let me back up even farther than that. Um, let's go to last week's Torah portion. I'm going to give you an example. For those of you who are new to the class, whether you're in class or you're listening by the recording, there was a principle of study that we learned, I think, year before last, called smichut. Smichut. And let me mark the place, and I'll type it into the chat box for you. Try to transliterate it. Um, if you're listening on the recording, I transliterated it as S-M-I-C-H-U-T, smichut, and that comes from really a two-letter root there, sam, uh, feminine would be sama, but sam means to place or to put something. For instance, ani sama et tasefer b'shuchan. I put the book on the table. I placed it there. And so when I place something in scripture, it's not random. Um, you know, it's not like we do where you say, oh, I think I put it over there. No, when something is placed in scripture, it's placed where it's placed for a de very definite reason. And it gives context to what's just happened. So in last week's Torah portion, we saw an instance of smichut. Sometimes it's not just where something is placed in a text, it's where it's placed in relation to other texts surrounding it that will shed light on the text itself. So in last week's portion in Yitro, chapter 20, let's see, Verse 8, and again, I know the, the verse numbers are off if you're using an English translation, but it should be somewhere around chapter 20, verse 8. It says, remember the, well, let's back up even one more verse. You shall not take the name of Hashem your God in vain, for Hashem will not absolve anyone who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you work and do all your work. But the seventh day is Sabbath to Hashem, your God. You shall not do any work, you and your son and your daughter, your slave and your maidservant and your animal and your convert within your gates. For in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, 
and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. Honor your father. Do you hear the smichut and reading about the Shabbat? It's what it's linked to. Honor your father and mother so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem your God gives you. So honoring your father and mother is not given in isolation from the commandment to keep Shabbat. Keeping Shabbat is connected to honoring your father and mother. And the mother in scripture frequently is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So keep the Shabbat fine to honor your father and your mother so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem your God gives you. Now let's think about what he's saying. He's trying to return them to the physical land of Israel. But in our study, we already know that what they are, the obstacles they're facing are much more than physical obstacles. They're, they're coming up against dark spiritual forces. So these physical dark forces have spiritual counterparts, um, dark spiritual forces that they're also fighting against. Um, and so as they're going into this physical land, what they're supposed to understand is that it's not just a land flowing with physical milk and honey. Remember, um, milk and honey are going to be part of the rivers of Eden in the tradition of the four rivers of Eden that there's like what, uh, milk, honey, wine, and balsam, I think. I'm not, I'm remembering right. So what is he telling them? He's giving them a message, not just, I want to take you back to this land where, you know, it breeds rocks overnight. There's nothing about the land itself that makes it any special, any more special than any other land to the physical eye. But it's to the spiritual eye that it's set apart. And when you see it as the physical representation of that lower garden and that it represents its boundaries eventually as he sets them in these Torah portions because he, he refers later in, in this Torah portion, not that one. He refers that the boundaries are going to be lengthened all the way to the brook of Egypt and to the great river, which is the Euphrates. And if you remember the Euphrates, the Euphrates was the Parat River, and it would have corresponded to the river that came out from underneath the throne from the upper garden and flowed into the lower garden, which we know is our, our whole picture of resurrection. Where do we go while we await the resurrection? Where do we function? We go to the lower garden. And so when he's talking about so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem your God gives you, and then you get another one, you shall not kill. <laughs> you don't give him a reason to need to resurrect someone too soon, right? It's, it's about death and resurrection. So he's, he's dropping little crumbs here for us to follow clues. And so linked to, sh linked to Shabbat is this idea of a day that's all Shabbat a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So why do we keep the Sabbath? Well, yes, in remembrance of the work of creation, when we still had the, that semi-supernatural body, the, the type of body that we will be resurrected back to in Messiah. So he's giving us Shabbat to make us think of the resurrection and what we will be in that day that is all Shabbat in the Messianic reign and even beyond. And how do we know even beyond? Because he says, so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem your God gives you. What land is he going to give us? Just the physical land or for the, to those who are righteous, he's going to give not only the physical land, but also the ability to function in that spiritual land of Israel. Everything is written here at more than one level. If we only read it at the physical level, it sounds like the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> and we all know that. We've all had one of those in our yard at some point. <laughs> 
you know, or the bookmark with the Ten Commandments that we won in Sunday school class. But these are these are elevated commandments because they're linking our resurrection, lengthening our days. And in fact, if we're going to do that, then we have to honor our father and mother in that higher spiritual sense. So don't kill. <laughs> uh, don't commit adultery. Don't do the things he's saying that would keep you out of that lower garden and from experiencing that day that's all Shabbat, the resurrection, and your days being lengthened upon that land, even into the eighth day. Because remember, they're in, built into both Passover and Sukkot are an eighth day. There's an idea there's going to be a messianic reign in the seventh millennium, the kingdom of Messiah, but then there'll be even a, a, another transition with the eighth day, which is also a Shabbat. And we're, I'll show you that right quick before we get into the eye for eye and tooth for tooth. If I can find it right quick. Where it shows you that hidden eighth day in Passover. I think it's farther back. Here you go. In chapter 23, verse 17, it says, and the idea here is he's talking about the seventh year, the year of release, but nevertheless, he didn't want us to think since that is a year of release where the total year is like a Shabbat rest like a jubilee, uh, where he just causes things to grow of their own accord, so that we don't mistake the message and say, okay, then we're going to suspend going up to Jerusalem to worship at the feast, and we're going to suspend the weekly Shabbat. And you can see where he says, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to suspend the weekly Shabbat. I don't want you to suspend coming up three times a year to Jerusalem to observe the feasts. I still want you to do that, even though it is the, the year of release, even though it's the seventh year. So it's a clarification right there. And verse 18, he says, you shall not slaughter the blood of my offering on chametz. Um, what does that mean? In other words, you have to have already destroyed the chametz, the leaven, before you can slaughter your lamb on the 14th of Nisan. So if you have to have that chametz already cleared out on the 14th of Nisan before you can offer that lamb, then you've just added an extra day. So it's a little harder to find because we know we're eating matzah for seven days. We get that. But this gives us a little detail that we put with the other details. And then we realize, well, actually, there's eight days in this Passover week, not just seven, if we begin measuring from the time that the chametz has to be destroyed out of the house. Okay. But that's, that's an example of smichut, where he's connecting or linking commandments so that we'll connect keeping Shabbat with honoring our mother and father, so that our days will be long in the land, so that it'll remind us not to kill. Why? Because death has no part in that resurrected life that he is preparing for us. And it even says in this Torah portion that the angel, that, there, that he is preparing a place for them. And the rabbis go on and they, they detail that the place he was preparing for them that he refers to in Mishpatim was actually preparing Jerusalem so that it would match the upper Jerusalem so the idea of Jerusalem coming down in, in John's revelation is not a new idea. It's a very old idea that for what we're seeing in this, this natural realm, there's something corresponding to it in the spiritual realm. Okay, 
So now let's go back and look at our smichut. Even though I've lost my place again. Uh, what was it, 21, 24? Here it is, yeah. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to start with verse 22, 21, 22. Because of smichut, we want to, when we get to this hard passage where it says an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, he's not going to leave us hanging out there wondering if we literally have to cut somebody else's eye out if they injure someone else's. Because again, that does sound pretty harsh and we're all glad that we don't have to justify that to our friends. Like, you want to go by the law, then you're going to start gouging out eyeballs. Unfortunately, we can say, well, according to the tradition that was handed down to us, it doesn't mean literally take out somebody's eyeball. It means to make restitution for the damage that you've done. Uh, but it says, when men will fight, and they will jostle a pregnant woman, and she will miscarry, but there will be no fatality. In other words, she didn't die. She just miscarried. He shall surely be penalized when the husband of the woman shall impose upon him, and he shall give it through judges' orders. Okay, that's where the rabbis are saying that this principle of placement really comes into action because it's what we're going about to read is going to be contextual to what we just read. There's a pattern right here. We had a, an altercation, but it was the, the fetus that miscarried. There was damage to the pregnant woman and her husband. But if she didn't die, it says, but if there will be a fatality, in other words, one of the already living human beings, uh, if there will be a fatality, then you shall give a life in place of a life. And then it goes on to say, an eye in place of an eye, a tooth in place of a tooth, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, a burn in place of a burn, a laceration in place of a laceration, a bruise in place of a bruise. All right, well, we could stop right there. So in context, what are we looking for? Well, here's the trouble. Let's just say that we were supposed to take this literally in terms of damages. Let's say that I, <laughs> most kids do it, we shoot each other with things we shouldn't shoot each other with, right? So let's say by accident, um, I throw a, a dart and I hit you in the eye. But let's think of two scenarios that could be anomalies to just a cut and dried case. What if I damaged your eye, but I didn't completely put it out? What if you still have 50% vision? How is the judge expected to take the offender and figure out how to take only 50% damage from his eye. You can't do that, right? How do I know what it will take? If you put a bruise on me, how do I know how much force it's gonna to take to put a corresponding bruise on you? Because people bruise differently. Some people, you just look at them and they bruise. Some people, you can beat them half the day and they don't, they don't bruise. So, there's an intrinsic difficulty in executing that if it's read only literally. And so, you know, you know they, the rabbis, they're going to get down and they're going to start investigating the words themselves and saying, what are we missing here? Let's get down to what the word literally says we're supposed to do. Because if I overimpose... Let's say I only damaged your eye 50% and the judge goes in there to, to execute the sentence, but he takes out my whole eye by mistake. 
Now, does that mean I take out the judge's eye? <laughs> or only take out 50% that he was supposed to take out to begin with. You can see how it can spin off a lot of problems there. Or what about this? Some people have a head trauma. And they may say, well, I'm blind, I can't see. You say, okay, we're gonna execute judgment. We're gonna put out your eyes. Because you hit this person in the head and they can't see anymore. Well, once their, their head starts healing, all of a sudden their vision's restored. Now what do you do? Because you've put out somebody's eyes, but now this person's eyesight's restored. So the rabbis are, are always going to try to err on the side of compassion. The more compassionate, the more lenient way of interpreting the passage. But our background tells us, I know a lot of you have, have studied a little bit the ancient Near Eastern uh, material that some people are out there teaching like Tyler and Rico and, and Dina and they're doing conferences and stuff and that's really good context for us because in this case it gives us a contrast. According to the Code of Hammurabi and the ancient Near Eastern law, then the, this would be literally true. You would literally, if you put out somebody's eyeball, then yours would be put out. It literally was an eye for an eye. So the rabbis say, is there anything different in our text that sets us apart from that understanding? Well, number one, what they, they do is they begin with context, which is why we started in verse 22. When men will fight and they will jostle, and there's, there's a damage there. Well, the man who caused the damage, who caused the miscarriage, you can't do the same thing back to him because he's not a female and he's not pregnant. You, you can't really do eye for eye, tooth for tooth in that situation, but it gives us a, a paradigm. When there's a physical damage to a person, such as a miscarriage, then the way that you are penalized for that is that you have to make restitution in a monetary way. And it, it says through, through a judge's order. So it could be through actual money. It could be through the transfer of your property. Maybe you say, I don't have any money. He says, fine, then you're gonna deed over the sacred of land to this person. The judge figures out what the value of that life was worth to her and her husband. So you don't kill him, you make restitution of money, property, or whatever. And so they break down not just the context and say, okay, it, it doesn't have to mean a little eye for eye or tooth for tooth. It could mean monetary restitution. And they start looking at the Hebrew text of it. And it says, um, in Hebrew, ayin, which means I, it's like the Hebrew letter ayin. And there's a little trick in this that you're going to love if you can get a hold of a Hebrew text or uh, a Hebrew uh, Torah scroll. Y'all are supposed to just know what I'm thinking at this point. <laughs> and, and if you don't know what I'm thinking, just guess and it'll be fine. <laughs> um, but it says ayin. I, tachat, ayin. In fact, I'm going to transliterate that for you. Well, spell check doesn't like me. Ayin, tachat, ayin. That means I, literally, under, I. And in English, it's usually translated out an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But it says, ayin, tachat, ayin. Shen, tachat, shen, tooth for tooth. Yad, tachat, yad. Hand under hand. Regel, tachat, regel. Foot under foot. So that's kind of strange wording. And... 
when you look at one way of saying tachat to mean under, it can mean for the way that it's translated like eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But it's a little bit deeper than that because they're, they go back in context. They say, okay, let's go back and look at one of the early contexts, like applying our rule of complete mention, progressive mention, first mention. So you go back to Genesis 4.25 where you see tachat used. And it says, and Adam was once again intimate with his wife and she had a son and he called his name Shait. For God has provided me with other offspring, tachat hevel, Abel, in place of hevel, in place of Abel, for he was killed by Cain. All right, now that's the key. Because he provided me with this son in the place of this son. To replace what I lost here, I was given this. Now on its face, we know that simply gouging out someone else's eye does not replace your eye. It can't. <laughs> That's not the proper um, translation, probably, of the word if we're looking at this as the guiding example of what it means under, I under I. But if it means I in place of I, this in place of this, then it makes more sense. It means in place of instead of as a replacement or if we're saying as a replacement for rather than in place of, which is how it's usually translated. But we know you can't put your eye in the place of this person's eye. So translating it out the way that it is in Genesis as a replacement for makes much more sense in its context. And then they give another context where tachat was used. And it's in, again, Genesis, Bereshit 22, 13. It says, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, a ram was entangled in the brush by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as an offering to Chat in place of his son. So the ram wasn't literally his son but it was offered in the place of his son, to take the place of his son. So they're saying, based on previous contexts of tachat, this under this, based on how it's placed within mishpatim, where we're given an example of here was damage, it was bodily damage, but you can't literally do the same thing to this guy, so he makes monetary restitution. And Jewish law, even in ancient times, has never interpreted this verse literally. In other words, that you would have to gouge out somebody's eye or cut off somebody's hand if they did the same to the person. It's always dictated a monetary restitution. The value of is understood to be there, the value of an eye in place of an eye. And their question was, all right, this is a difficult text. In fact, it's, I think in modern times, thrown up to us a lot, um, not just because we want to live by the Torah, but to Christians in general, by atheists, by agnostics, by people of other religions who think they're more you know, peaceful and, you know, it's all good. And they say, well, how could, how could this be prescribed where you would gouge out somebody's eye or cut their hand off or cut their foot off? That's barbaric. And we don't have to defend that because historically it's never been understood that way. Um, <clears throat> I thought my voice survived. There's a contrast because the way that Jews see the human body 
is that you don't own your body. And Paul alluded to this. Um, the apostles transmitted this in their letters that basically you're just the, the householder. They say, you know, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, you're the caretaker of your body, of your temple, but you don't own it. Your creator owns the body. He created the body, so it belongs to him. He simply put a soul and a spirit in there as the caretakers. And so since he owns your body, you don't have permission to sign it over, basically, um, for abuse, specifically for abuse. In fact, um, one of the rabbis commented he said it's forbidden to strike one's fellow, even if he gives him permission to strike him. For a person does not own his or her body at all to allow striking or embarrassment or to cause pain of any kind. So when corporal punishment is administered, like the, the 40 stripes, they never did 40. They always did 39. And in fact, the judges would reduce that number. They could do up to 39, but they looked at the person that was receiving the punishment. And number one, you were not supposed to punish the person to the point of humiliation and shame or beyond what his body could bear. So if they look at this person and say, he's just not that healthy and we don't think he can endure more than, than 10 blows, then they would set it at 10 blows. And then it could go all the way up to 39 stripes. But the idea was to never shame and humiliate the person any more than what was already necessary for there to be justice. Even the corpse on the tree had to be taken down before sundown. That was important because regardless, what does it say? Um, the saying goes, crime creates punishment. Punishment doesn't create crime. Crime creates punishment. So even when the person's crime created his punishment, you're still responsible for acknowledging that this human being is made in the image of Elohim, every human being, not just every Israelite, every human being was made in the image of Elohim. So you don't have permission to mutilate a corpse or to excessively shame another human being, even when you do have to administer punishment. To the point, they say, you don't have permission to mutilate your body. That's, that's not part of being a good householder. Um, so the, the idea of literally eye for eye, tooth for tooth, it's not practical. It wouldn't practically work because it would very easily um, create this whole chain of events where, okay, now I've overdone it. Now you've got to punish me back for what I've done. It, it wouldn't make any sense. But it's always been that money was paid or some type of property assessment was made to compensate for the damage. And so it would read more like an eye under an eye. Taking the more literal translation of the passage, an eye under an eye, a tube under a tube, a hand under a hand, a leg under a leg. And it would you would extend from there. Remember, you, you can take the specific examples and you could apply it to like situations. So it doesn't, it's not confined to just these body parts. All right, anything on your body is important. If you were created with it, they say, then it's valuable. And if somebody damages any part of you that's been created, then they're responsible to restore to you what you have lost, at least in a monetary way. So, uh, just like... Um, chapter 21, verse 18, it says, uh, he will only pay damages of lost wages and medical expenses. 
again, taking that other example and, and pulling it into our example. So we see that the placement tells us that the price of damaging your friend is financial, not corporal punishment. There are specific crimes for which you would receive corporal punishment. But in these cases, not so. They're applying the, the restitution part of it. And so they're, they're seeing it in the context of the adjacent verse. But, you know, rabbis always have dissenting opinions, right? But then they take all these opinions and they say, this helps us think about the whole problem. And one of the rabbis, Rabbi Eliezer, says, no, it's literally true. Eye for eye, but not the way you think. Because... It depends not on the value of the person's eye who was the victim. He said, by all rights, yes, this is what the Holy One meant. It's even reflected in the Code of Hammurabi. By all rights, you should give up your eye. But you can't because of the problems we talked about. So... How do, we, how do we see this? We see this as it's not going to be an assessment based on the value of the victim's eye. It's going to be an assessment based on the value of your eye. What is your eye worth? And that's a good way to think of it because the perpetrator is going to pay the value of the lost eye but he can't take out his own eye and give it to him and make it right. But you deserve to lose your eye. The, he, wants, he says the Torah is written in this way, so we remember, if we were the one who did it, that we will always remember we deserve to lose an eye. So merely allowing us to restore with property or money is an act of compassion. It, it gets our way of thinking in the proper place, not just that, oh, I'll pay him off, because, you know, if you were a rich person, you might do it on purpose. <laughs> if you didn't like somebody and you knew you had plenty of money, <laughs> I'd go put their eye out, not just pay for it, right? <laughs> I'll do both of them. I can afford two eyes, right? <laughs> Here you go. You can pay them before you do it. Well, it doesn't want to encourage that kind of behavior, right? So he always wants the perpetrator to understand that no matter what you pay for this eye, it's never going to be the same as making, and, and it kind of goes back to our own salvation experience when we accept Yeshua as Messiah and we accept him in place of us. Right? Because we know the, the value is never going to be equal. And we should be really grateful that he's there to atone for our sins. Because there's nothing, there's no animal we could offer that would be enough. We could offer ourselves and it still wouldn't be enough. There's nothing we have that's enough. And therefore we should be grateful. It, it enters us into that same sense of gratitude. So I can never take for granted that I got off easy by just paying money because I took out this person's eye. You deserve to lose your own eye, but you should always be grateful that you didn't have to give your own eye. And he says, that's why the text is written as it's written. Um, Let's see, and I don't have the citation on this. I didn't have time to get everything written down, but um, he quotes from a verse, and he says, he shall give the ransom of his life, the value of the life. And I might have time to look that up before tomorrow. Um, so what are our expectations here? If we have been damaged, 
physically, we are entitled to compensation. But here's the interesting thing. If we go, let me make sure I can find it. That was part of my, I didn't have time to write today, so I'm skipping all over the book. Um, but where it's talking about a strike, the rabbis are, are including in like striking a person, speaking against a person. And they say, when you, when you deal a blow to another person in terms of words, we have to think too, what ransom will we give for those words? And that was something I hope we have time to look at maybe tomorrow. But again, context, michut, It's really odd because where is it? Where it talks about the fire. Is it after the ox goring? Yeah. In chapter twenty two, verse five, it says, When a fire will go forth and fine thorns, and a stack of grain, or a standing crop, or a field will be consumed, the one who kindled the fire shall surely pay. All right, they, they thought that was kind of an odd insertion, and I do too. In the context, you know, we're talking about oxes goring people, and wandering donkeys, and, you know, lost eyeballs and things, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's another type of damage when a fire will go forth and, and consume things that belongs to your neighbor. It says, the one who kindled the fire shall surely pay. And the discussion here is it's, it's like a wildfire. You accidentally caused a fire to get started on your property. But what happens, you start a fire on your property, and then that that fire spreads to your neighbor and consumes what is his. Like a stack of grain or a, a, a standing crop. Maybe it's a crop that's ready to be harvested even, and all of a sudden his year's income is gone because you were careless with the fire. And that's what James says. He says the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity, right? He says, it, it, he says, the tongue can no man tame, and it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so when we start fires with our tongues, we might just be starting it in our own fields. We might be starting it in our own domain. But that flame can be carried by another person who's not as careful. And they can carry that flame over, and all of a sudden, your neighbor that you spoke about, his reputation is being burned up because people are carrying those flames through their tongues. Right? And right now, it's rampant. I mean, the news, the Facebook, you name it. Any way that people get together to talk or communicate, they are consuming one another alive with their tongues. And you might say, well, I just, I just posted that for my friends. Well, you know what's going to happen if you just post it for your friends. It's, it's going to get retold. And eventually it's going to get back to the person, and it's going to be part of destroying what is theirs. And ultimately, all you have at the end of the day is what they put in your obituary your character, right? What did they do? In your obituary, they put down the best things they can think to say about you. Well, when your tongue starts wagging and starts setting little fires that get carried over and consuming your neighbor's reputation, then you're taking the only dignity that we die with. You don't get to take your house with you. You don't get to take your car with you. You don't get to take your really, really, really nice clothes in your closet with you and all those shoes 
you don't get to take, I mean, you can bury the medals and the, the, you know, the honors and plaques and stuff, but they're just going to be forgotten. It's the character of the person that people remember. And if we're assassinating that character with our tongues, then we've set their field on fire. And we've damaged good that we possibly they could do. Um, just trying to find the context for that. Here it is. It's in chapter 21. And the comment is made in reference to, well, it actually points out another incident of smichut, where it says, one who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. One who kidnaps a man and sells him and he was found in his possession shall surely be put to death. One who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Did you see the interruption in that? We went from striking father or mother and cursing father and mother and inserted right in the middle of that was this uh, kidnapping. You get the death penalty for kidnapping. And it says that the Torah interrupted the topic of offenses against parents and wrote one who steals a man between one who strikes his father or his mother and one who curses his father or his mother. It appears that the source of the argument um, is that it's comparing striking to cursing. And that makes perfect sense. Striking and cursing somebody, saying bad things about people, they're equivalent. And in a sense, there's more than one way to kidnap a person. And that's to take control of them, to take possession of their character, and take it in places they do not wish it to be taken. <laughs> I don't want you to take my reputation to that place. I don't agree. I don't consent to go there. But we do that all the time. And it's just, it's done so casually. Um, what was the incident last week? I, I didn't have Wi-Fi this last few days, so I'm really out of touch. I just realized uh, on my way home that the government wasn't shut down anymore. Um, but it was a thing with a, a teenage boy that was on a bunch of news outlets and it looked like the boy was taunting a Native American a peace activist or something. And then when people found out the rest of the story, it was the opposite. It was the boy and, and the other school kids who were being taunted. But what had happened apparently is the first story got out there and made the rounds and then by the time the whole story got out there, the reputations had already been destroyed. The wildfires had already been set. And once the fire burns the field, you can't regrow the grain. It takes another year to replace the grain that's been burned up. And that's the way we are as human beings. When somebody damages our reputation, it damages our ability to trust other people. It damages our ability to fellowship with other people. It damages our ability to form those relationships that we need to have within the body of Messiah. And we say, well, I'm sorry, I just don't trust people right now. I've been burned too many times. Have you heard that expression? Well, you get burned one too many times, you just don't want to be around people. <laughs> and so you're damaging this person's ability whether guilty or innocent, it, it makes more sense to go to the person and say this is true, but somehow we're keeping the news in business because we like to hear juicy stuff like that. And nobody reads the retraction on page 10. 
when it, we find out, well, that wasn't really accurate or that was taken out of context. And you guys know how hurtful it is when somebody will take one little piece of what you said out of this much and try to pass that off as what you actually meant. And that's not true. They need the full context of what you said. Um, but social media thrives on cherry picking a few sentences and then making a big blow up out of it. And Taurus telling us, this is not acceptable. When you curse someone, when you disrespect someone like that, it's like you're striking a blow against them. And how will you restore to that person what can't be unburned? You can repent. You can say, I'm sorry. You can try to restore the damage. You can try to print the retraction. You can try to call all the people you told it to. But you're never going to really, truly restore that person's reputation. So I thought that was a, just a great lesson within a lesson. Um, with the idea that even if I want to compensate someone for damage I've done, I can never exactly reproduce what I've done to that person. Uh, so what the victim is actually being at the, it's the victim who is still compromising. What the victim deserves is his eye back. Well, we can't do that. So we're really asking the victim to be the more compassionate person and accept that payment, that compensation of what he really deserves, which is own eye. That's what he deserves, to have his own eye. But he says, okay, I will take this payment in lieu of restoration because it can't be healed. It can't be fixed. Um, and that's what the rabbis say. The reason the Torah, as it's moving through these, these different mishpatim, that the reason it, it wrote it in such a strange way, an eye under an eye, a tooth under a tooth, is because that perpetrator should understand that what he actually deserves is to give up his own eye, is to give up his own tooth. And so he should be grateful that all he has to do is to make a monetary restitution. Now, I'm running out of time, but here's the fun thing. And this is why it's, it's fun to, to learn Hebrew, because every now and then you stumble on something, like we say, smichut, where he places something on a page is important. And uh, one of the rabbis pointed out that as you look at the written text of this passage, and you're reading where it says, ayin tachat ayin, or an eye under an eye, Remember, the Hebrew word for I, ayin, is ayin yud nun. And so as you're reading through there, you look below that ayin in the text, that ayin yud nun. Look below it. And what you'll see is that the letters that are subsequent to each of the letters of the word ayin spell keseth. I'll type that in there for you. It's um, C E or I think with a K sounds better. Kesa in Hebrew, K E S E F in English is the way I'm transliterating it. Kesa is silver or money. So as you're looking at the letters in the eye for the eye, you look below the ayin, it says the letters that are subsequent to each of the letters of the word ayin are kesef. They spell kesef, money. So for an I, you pay tachat underneath an I. 
How are you supposed to pay? Underneath the eye. What's underneath the eye? Money. Kesa. So the letter under the ayin is pe. The letter under the yud is kaf. And the letter under the noon is samech, which spells kesef. Thus, the written words of the Torah include all the information necessary to understand the application of the Torah principle, which manifests both God's judgment, the eye for an eye, and his compassion, which is you pay with money under the eye. And I thought that was just pretty darn cool. Um, I would have never thought to look under, you know, we talk about placement and where things go on the page and so forth, uh, or the fact that something's repeated and that's supposed to make us pay attention when something's repeated or when it looks like something is omitted or when something's out of place, like going from, you know, don't hit your father and mother and then there's something in here and then there's, uh, don't curse your father and mother. What are we seeing there? Uh, the rabbis see that as a strike. And um, when you speak, when you curse somebody, it's like a strike. Um, and it, it does. It damages a reputation in a way that can never truly be restored, probably until Messiah fixes our our minds, our memories, and all those good things. So I'll stop there.